Well, good evening. Welcome to the Pastor's Midweek Bible Study. Thank you for joining us at home. Thank you all for joining us here in person. You should be here with us. We'd love to have you on Wednesday mornings. We start about 8.45. Jerry just led them in a rousing song that woke all of them up, and he told them that he's having something. I'm, I, I didn't catch all of it, but he's giving away a Cadillac in the next few weeks, so you'll certainly want to get with Jerry about that. Uh, come and join us sometime. We'll be doing this on uh uh, Wednesday mornings until school starts back in August, which is not very far away at all, is it? Here we are in, in mid-June already, and it'll just be a few weeks, and we'll be getting ready for the beginning of the school year. We're delighted that you've joined with us today. We're going to start a new study uh, today, and it, I don't know exactly how long it will take us to complete this. I haven't tried to calendar that out. We'll just take it as it comes and see how long it takes, but uh, we're going to start a new study today in just a moment. Before we jump into it, let's have a uh, season of prayer. You take just a moment and ask the Lord to uh, speak to you in these next few moments from His Word. Take a moment and thank the Lord for who He is and for loving you. Thank the Lord for sending His Son to pay the price for our sin and for that amazing grace that He gives to us. Lord, you've heard our hearts as we've prayed individually. Uh, we do acknowledge that you're God. You are majestic and wonderful, awesome. And to just come into your presence is a great privilege. Thank you for the opportunity to do this. Thank you for giving us the key that opens the door to the very throne room of heaven. Lord, together we bring our petitions and our requests and our thanksgiving to you. You've blessed us so much, and we are aware that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. Sometimes we have heavy hearts about things that burden us. Often they deal with our families, those that we love the most. And we want to see them walk closer with you, or we want to see... Uh, something happened in their life that they need and we pray for them and we do that collectively we pray for our families sometimes children or grandchildren a brother or a sister sometimes a parent Lord we pray for those that are hurting for those that are dealing with illness or uh, long-term difficulties that they're facing we pray for those that are going through changing seasons of life, and sometimes that's good and happy and, and joyful, and sometimes it's not. And for all of those that are going through changing times in their lives, I pray that you would give them your presence. Lord, you've blessed us so much as a church. We are, we are so cognizant of your hand upon us. There's a joy in this place. There's a there's an enthusiasm and an excitement, and over and over we're seeing your hand blessing, and, and we give you thanks, and, and we give you the glory for all of those things, and we continue to look to you and ask you to continue to pour out those blessings according to your plan. Lord, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I thank you for those that have joined on live stream, and I pray that more and more people will continue to get back into their local churches and fellowship and gather and worship and study and serve and do all of those things in Jesus name to the glory of the Father thank you for hearing us thank you for being with us now we're going to open your word and I pray that you'd speak to us from it in Jesus name amen well we had a great great day Sunday it was the first time since uh, I think I'm right in saying this it was the first time since COVID happened that we had over 3,000 in attendance in church Sunday and other than Easter of course Easter we did but um, 3,000 in the summer and, and on a summer Sunday that's that's pretty significant so uh, people are returning and I'm glad for that if you haven't returned yet I certainly encourage you to do so well we've come to the book of Psalms now we we for a decade now we've been studying in the Old Testament on Wednesday nights and so we've studied Genesis Exodus Leviticus Numbers Deuteronomy Joshua Judges Ruth first and second Samuel first and second Kings first and second Chronicles Ezra and Nehemiah now we just finished Esther so we should be in Job, right? That's what comes next. Uh, but you're studying Job in your connect group. 
and uh, it just didn't make much sense to me to repeat what you're already studying in the month of June and July to, to do that on Wednesday. So I'm just going to skip the book of Job right now. We may come back to it one day, but right now we're going to skip the book of Job and go right on into the Psalms. And we're going to study uh, through this wonderful uh, passage of God's Word, this wonderful section of God's Word known as the Psalms. Now, Psalm, the word Psalm means a song that is sung to a musical instrument. So all of these are songs, uh, songs that have been written by somebody for a specific purpose. By the way, when you're referring to Psalms, if you're referring to the book in general, it's, it has an S on it. It's Psalms with an S. If you're referring to one chapter in the Psalms, it's Psalm with no S. So it's Psalm 23 with no S. It's Psalm 100 with no S. In totality, if you're talking about the whole book, you would put the uh, word S on it uh, because you're referring to the Psalms in, in general. Now, if you were to ask the average person who wrote the Psalms, the answer would be David, and they would be right and wrong all at the same time. David did write most of the Psalms. Uh, 73 of them out of the 150, seven, 73 of them are attributed to King David. Now, there are 50 that we don't know who wrote them. So he could very well have written some of those 50. So he may have written a good bit more than 73. But 73, absolutely, we know for sure because that's who Scripture says wrote it. 73, uh, David wrote. Then there are uh, two that David's son, Solomon, uh, wrote. Solomon wrote the 72nd Psalm, and he wrote the 127th Psalm. One of the Psalms, the 90th, is attributed to Moses. So that would be the oldest of all of the Psalms, uh, and only one of those. And then there are 11 Psalms that when you look at the heading, and under each of the Psalms, each of the chapters, uh, it will... Uh, if, it, if we know who wrote it, it will tell us who it's attributed to. And there are 11 of them that will say, excuse me, 12 of them that will say Asaph, a man named A-S-A-P-H, Asaph, or the family of Asaph. Now, who, who was that? Well, Asaph was a, he was the minister of music. He was, a, uh, he was known as a prophet. He was known as a, a, a preacher, but he was also a musician. And he wrote many, many songs. And then there are 11 more on top of the 12 that are attributed to Asaph. There are 11 more that it, it just says the sons of Asaph. That means descendants of. Uh, I think technically any minister of music is a son of Asaph. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a passing on of that legacy of writing this music to, to the Lord. So uh, th those are the people who wrote the Psalms. And then that leaves about 50 that we don't really know uh, who wrote them, and, and of course, uh, as I said, David may have written uh, a number of those. When you think about the span of time that the Psalms were written, it's huge. It's centuries, because Mo Moses, the oldest one, M Moses goes back <laughs> almost to the beginning, and then the latest of the Psalms was written during the Babylonian captivity. Now, we just finished studying Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, so we, you, you remember that the Babylonian captivity was from 586 B.C. to 538 B.C., so that's a huge span of time. Now, how do we know that the 137th Psalm was written during the Babylonian captivity? Well, let's just flip over there real quick and see if... if uh, if we can see why we think that. Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. So it is obviously a psalm that was written during the time of exile. It was during the time of captivity uh, as, as the Hebrew nation was taken into Babylon. So all the way from Moses to Babylonian captivity, we're talking about a period of centuries. Now, it's believed by most conservative biblical scholars that Ezra may have been the person. We just studied Ezra and Nehemiah. That Ezra may have been the person that compiled all of these, put them all together in the form that we now have. Interestingly, in 1946 and 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran, Israel, you remember that, and, and all of the, uh, the, the uh, good that came out of those discoveries. Well, what, what, what good came out of it? Well, so much of the Old Testament was found in those caves. Almost an entire copy of the book of Isaiah. Almost. 
And, and here's what's so wonderful about that. When you took those most ancient copies, the Dead Sea Scrolls, almost a complete book of Isaiah, when you compare it to what we have in our book of Isaiah, the differences are minute. They are insignificant differences that would have just been mistakes of a, of a scribe making as they were copying from one to another. So it, not that we need any validation of God's Word. God's Word is God's Word and it stands on its own. But it really, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were a great validation of God's Word. But I say that because many psalms were found. I think 30-plus psalms were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were very important and have been tucked away and hidden there in those caves uh, in Qumran. Now, there are seven different types of psalms. You might want to jot these down there on the top of your, uh, the, the page there where, where the book of Psalms begins. There are seven different types. Uh, one would be lament, that is sadness, repenting, sorrow, those kinds of emotions that come out of it, uh, 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 lamentations almost, lament lamenting over something that has happened. A second type would be thanksgiving. There are many psalms of thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for his blessings and provisions and all of those things. Third would be enthronement. That is to acknowledge that God is God, that God is creator, that God is sustainer, that God is over all, in all, through all, that God is God. So just the enthronement psalms. The fourth would be called pilgrimage psalms. And you might hear that sometimes referred to as ascent, psalms of ascent. Remember when they would go to Jerusalem, they would sing these psalms. And uh, uh, there, there's a group of them that they would regularly and routinely sing as they would go to Jerusalem. And by the way, uh, ascent means up and any time from any part of Israel that you went to Jerusalem, you went up because Jerusalem was the highest place there in Israel. So they were ascending up to Jerusalem, ascending up to Zion. So uh, the songs of ascent are pilgrimage. The fifth would be royal psalms. Now royal in probably two different ways. Royal sometimes in the fact that, that they are psalms about the coming Messiah, uh, the royalty of God that way. But also uh, it's, it, it's believed that these were psalms that were sung in the presence of royalty, in the presence of a king or, or uh, some kind of head of state, something like that. The sixth would be wisdom psalms. Uh, just passages that give great words of wisdom, much like the, the book of Proverbs, just great wisdom. And then the seventh would be imprecatory psalms. Now, that's a word that we don't use too much, but what that means is those are psalms of cursing or not cussing, cursing or judgment, uh, uh, kind of speaking uh, a word of... of uh, uh, judgment against someone, uh, imprecatory psalms, and there are a number of those. Well, that's, that's enough background information on psalms. Let's just jump into the first one and see what we are looking at today. Now, some weeks as we go through this, uh, and I, like I said, I haven't really uh, nailed this down. When you're looking at a book as big as the psalms and 150 chapters, you don't exactly know how big the piece is that you're going to bite off to chew on on any particular week. So I don't know how long uh, we'll deal with this. There will be some weeks that we might look at two or three psalms at the same time. Uh, there might be weeks that we only deal with one, and, and when we get to the 119th psalm, you know how long that one is. Uh, we'll just bite it off as we get to it and see what happens. But today we're going to look at one of them. We're going to look at the first psalm, and uh, it's, it's a very interesting one here. It deals with freedom and, and choices. You know, I, I guess as Americans, we are as aware and thankful for freedom as any people on earth. We understand freedom. We celebrate freedom. We have special holidays to just celebrate our freedom. We defend freedom around the world. We fight for freedom. We love freedom. We live for freedom. And freedom gives us choices. We celebrate our choices. Now, the reality is sometimes I get frustrated by the freedom that people have to make choices because they make bad choices. But that is a result of freedom. We can make choices. Now, some choices in life don't matter too much. When you get home tonight, if you decide you want to watch a rerun of 
uh, uh, America's Home Videos or you want to watch a basketball game or a baseball game, that choice doesn't matter too much. You know, pick, pick which one. It, it just doesn't matter. Some choices don't matter. If you want to get your ears pierced, <laughs> it's just a choice, you know. Whether you want to do that or not, how you wear your hair, whether you dye your hair or not, whether you have hair or not, it's a choice, right? Whether, you, you know, it, <laughs> I see some guys shaking their heads. It's not a choice. It's just, it, it just, you know, it happens. But uh, there, there are a lot of decisions we make in life that are, it, it just doesn't matter. Then there are some other decisions we make that's a choice between good and better. Remember the old Sears catalog? Remember Sears. <laughs> Uh, remember the old Sears catalog that we used to get, and particularly at Christmas time, you know, you always got the big thick one that came for the whole year, but then you got the special one that came right before Christmas and had all the Christmas stuff in it. And I remember looking at the Sears catalog, and it would have in it, if you were looking at lawnmowers, for example, it would have one, and it would show a picture, and it would say, good, and it was a certain price. And then it would have another one that was a little bit more, and it would say, better and then it would have one that was a little bit higher price and it would say best good better best well choices are like that some choices there you can make a good choice but there's a better choice you know if you get hungry tonight and you want a snack before you go to bed you can go to the refrigerator and get an apple or you can get a bowl of bluebell now there one tastes better But one's probably better for you. So choices can be good or they can be better. But then there are choices that are good and bad, right? Those are moral choices. And and, and those are choices that we really shouldn't argue about those things. We don't vote on those things. God tells us what's right and wrong. God tells us what's good and evil. And and, and so there are choices between that, that, that don't matter. Their choices between good and better, and their choices between good and bad. Now, Psalm 1 is a choice between good and evil. Now, here's the thing about choices. We get to choose what we do. We get to make our choice, but we do not get to choose the consequences. A lot of people forget that. They think their freedom to make choices also gives them the freedom to determine what direction their life's going to go when they make those choices, and that's not always true. We, we have freedom to make choices, but we don't get to choose the consequences. Go back to that bowl of bluebell ice cream. You do have the, the freedom to make the choice to eat you a big helping bowl of bluebell ice cream every night before you go to bed. You can even choose to put a wad of chocolate syrup on top of it if you want to, but you cannot choose what the consequences of that will be, and there will be some consequences that come from that choices have consequences so let's see what the psalmist said how i'm going to read the whole thing and then we'll come back and talk about it how happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers instead his delight is in the lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night He is like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not survive the judgment, and sinners will not be in the community of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Now, the writer of Psalms here, by the way, let me pause for just a minute. I didn't say this in, in those introductory remarks, and I probably should have. There are five sections to, to the book of Psalms. And you'll notice right above Psalm 1 in most of your Bible, some of you may have an exception to this, but I think almost all of your Bible will have something right above Psalm 1 that says uh, book 1. There are five sections in the Psalms, and 
why they're divided this way uh, we don't know for sure we do uh, believe that it's probably a nod to the five books of the of the Pentateuch the Genesis Exodus Leviticus Numbers Deuteronomy but just five sections so when you come as you move through this as you come to the next section and it says book two and then book three and book four that was just a division of these books and it was helpful to them as they uh, put all of this together so uh, the I meant to say that earlier. So let's talk about the two choices that are listed here. One, the way of righteousness. And second, the way of wickedness. Now he says there in verse 1, and under the idea of the way of righteousness, he says, how happy is the man. Some of your translations may say blessed. How blessed is the man. I think a literal translation of that word, a good accurate translation is very fortunate. How very fortunate is the man who does not. The way of the righteous is a person, a man or a woman, who has learned to say no. You ever known somebody that just doesn't know how to say no? They're parents that don't know how to say no to their children. They're people that don't know how to say no to temptation. They just don't know how to say no. And that leads to problems. I, I know some people who, who would, they would say, if you had a conversation with them, they would say that they really want Jesus in their life. They really want that. But they don't know how to say no to the things that kind of keep that from being reality. They, 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 they kind of live with one foot in the things of God and one foot in the things of the world. And if you were here Sunday morning, I tried to make the point in saying this, To be in sync with the world is to be out of sync with the Word. And to be in sync with the Word is to be out of sync with the world. And you can't have both. So he says, blessed is, very fortunate is the man or the woman who has learned how to say no. They will not follow the advice of the wicked. That means they don't think like the world. Blessed is the man or the woman who does not think like the world thinks. We ought to think different than the world. Uh, you know, when you, when you listen to people talk, when you, when you watch things on television, when you listen to the music of our day, it, it's easy to see what's happened in our lifetime. This, the, the, the culture has just pounded and pounded and pounded with all of these ideas that if you go back... 40 years ago or 30 years ago and if you had taken some of the ideas today that are just kind of accepted it's just the way it is and if you had said to our forefathers or our fathers and mothers 30 years ago hey what do you think about this and and we just kind of said what's commonly accepted in society today that if somehow you could take someone from 30 years ago and just turn the television on tonight and let them listen to the words that are spoken they would be appalled they would be appalled but like a frog that's put into a kettle of water and the heat is turned up you know they say that if you if you took a boiling pot of water and you threw a frog into it the frog would immediately jump out but if you put the frog into room temperature water and slowly turn the heat up the frog isn't aware that he's being boiled in the moment and the frog stays in the water until he's boiled that's what our culture has done and where if 20 years ago 30 years ago 40 years ago if if those people heard what is common in our culture today they would just be shocked but we have lived through that and the temperature has just been turned up little by little by little to the point that we're just we're just thinking like the world thinks and we shouldn't very fortunate is the person who does not think like the world thinks that's what he says You don't follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners. That means not only do we not think like the world thinks, but we don't act like the world acts. We're not going to do what the world does. Even though the world has decided this is is normal now. This is this is 2021. This is modern life. This is okay. We're not going to think like the world thinks, and we're not going to act like the world acts. And then he says, or join in a group of mockers. We're not going to join in with the world. 
I think that idea, that word join, I think it means to walk in lockstep. We're not going to walk in step. I don't want to be in sync with the world. Now, if the world is in sync with the word, wonderful. But I don't want to be in sync with the world as opposed to being in sync with what God's word says. So, very fortunate is the, is the person who has learned to say no to the advice that you don't think like the world, you don't act like the world, you don't join in fellowship with the world. Instead, you see that in verse 2, instead, his delight, that means priority, his, his focus, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. You know, we, we often read God's Word, and that's so good. But we need to learn to meditate on God's Word as well. I, I've often said the difference between reading and meditating is the difference between skiing and scuba diving. Skiing is fun, and you see, you go further, go faster. You see more. Wind's in your face. It's, it's great fun. But scuba diving is stopping and kind of dropping anchor and, and, and spending some time in a spot, and you'll see things under the water. Oh, you skimmed over them while you were skiing. They were there. They were there. You just, you just were past them before you knew it. And scuba diving, you, you go deeper. Uh, when the Scripture says we ought to meditate on the things of God, that's what it means. We ought to, spend some time. We ought to go a little deeper and spend some time. That idea of meditate, as uh, repugnant as this thought probably is to some of you, it, it's the idea of a cow chewing its cud. You know, a cow has multiple stomachs. They swallow whatever they've eaten, and it goes down into their stomach. And, and they say that at various times during the day, the, the, the cow, this is the repugnant part, the cow will kind of, what's a sweet word for vomit? Um, regurgitate, thank you. The, the cow will bring that cud back up and chew it and then swallow it and then chew it well that's what we ought to do with God's word we ought to think about it through the day you don't just read it and be done with it check the box I read today's Bible passage so okay I feel good that I did it no we meditate on that we think about that we let that become a part of who we are his delight is in the Lord's instructions he meditates on it day and night he's like a tree planted beside the streams of water that bears fruit in its season what's the fruit he's talking about I think he's saying that when the child of God looks into the word of God and by the spirit of God is transformed into the image of God for the glory of God. That's the fruit that is produced by meditating on God's Word. When, when we take God's Word, we meditate on that, the, the Spirit of God molds us into the image of God that He wants us to be. Whatever He does, uh, it, 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 it grows. His leaf does not wither. Whatever He does prospers. So the first three verses there is the way of righteousness now look at what he says in verse 4 and 5 and 6 he's talking now about the way of wickedness he says the wicked are not like this instead they're like the chaff that the wind blows away he he's saying there's no foundation here there's no root system there's there's no depth here and so uh they, they may they may try spiritual things but there's there's no depth to that so they it, 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 it quickly blows away the wicked will not survive the judgment the sinners will not be in the community of the righteous for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked leads to ruin we're all free to make our choices but we are not free to make the results of our choices I've always liked this story. I don't know where I first heard it, but, uh, so I don't know who to attribute it to. I heard a preacher say it years ago, and it just kind of, you know, you hear some things that just stick with you. This one stuck with me. Years ago, there was a, a jewel thief named Arthur Berry. He was known as the gentleman thief. He committed over 150 burglaries in his, if you can call a, a thief a career. In his career, he had 150 
thefts that he was known for. And he always wore a tuxedo, white gloves and a tuxedo. He was known as the gentleman thief. And he only broke into the homes of wealthy people, oftentimes people he knew and rubbed shoulders with. He would go to the same parties and he would... He, he ran in their circles, and he knew when they were in town and out of town, and he would break into their homes, and he knew where their valuables were. He'd oftentimes been in a party in that very house and would talk about a piece of art and learn its value and go back and get it. 150 burglaries, and this is decades ago. He, it was estimated that he stole over $15 million worth of jewels and art. He spent 50, 50 uh, excuse me, he spent 25 years in prison, and when he was released from prison, he ended up as a short order cook in a diner in Chicago. A newspaper reporter uh, was doing a story about him and found out where he was working, and the reporter went to interview Arthur Berry about his life. And so Arthur Berry answered the questions told about his experiences and as they were finishing the interview Arthur Berry said I want you to do something in whatever story you write he said I want you to tell your readers that the person that Arthur Berry stole the most from was Arthur Berry the choices that I made in my life the things that I did have results have resulted in a direction of my life that robbed me of many of the things that people are able to do. But that's the way of wickedness. And never forget that you have choices, but your choices have consequences. You can choose the choice. You don't choose the consequence. So choose to say no to the things that are wrong and choose to say yes to the things that are of God and be a man or a woman of righteousness. And when you do, the Scripture says, you will in all things prosper. Well, that's Psalm 1, 149 to go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day and for the chance to open your word and study. Uh, bless the rest of this day. Help us to live it in Jesus' power. We pray in his name. Amen.